Hi, and welcome to the very first global online Azure Bootcamp. My name is Aidan Finn, and I'm hosting your keynote for today, and I'm one of the organizers of this event. I'm an Azure MVP. I've been a Microsoft Valuable Professional now for 11 years. I started off as a Config Manager MVP, then I was a Hyper-V MVP for nine years, and I've been an Azure MVP now for the last couple of years. In my day job, I work as a principal consultant for Innofactor Norway, where I work exclusively on Microsoft Azure infrastructure solutions. So helping you know, mid to large businesses get into the cloud, do it right. I'm also the owner of a company which I use to deliver uh, training, uh, Azure training around Europe called Cloud Mechanics. I've been working as, or in, well, I've been working in IT since 1996. I've been working, I started working as a developer and then I was a consultant, I've been a sysadmin, and I've been in technical pre-sales. I'm working as a consultant once again. I've been blogging since 2011 on AidenFin.com. You can also find some articles I've written over the years on Petri.com, and I tweet as at Joe underscore Elway. The Global Azure Online Bootcamp. What is it? Why is it? Well, the Global Azure Bootcamp is a community event that's been running for six or seven years around the world. The idea was that communities, local communities, would get together on a fixed Saturday in the year and share their expertise about Microsoft Azure and learn about Microsoft Azure. And it's been growing over those past six or seven years and it's everywhere around the planet, everywhere from New Zealand to Hawaii. There are sessions running for nearly 24 hours around the, day, around the world on this day. However, some people can't get to a local event, some people can't speak at a local event, and they get, kind of get left out. And that was a situation here in Ireland. Um, it looked like there wasn't going to be a local event. There were some sponsorship and venue issues. So I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be kind of cool if we did an online event? And I happened to say that while I was drunk, as it happens, uh, when I was over at the Microsoft MVP Summit at Microsoft headquarters last month. And the UK and Ireland lead for MVPs, a woman called Claire Smith, who works in Microsoft UK, she loved this idea, ran off to the organizer of the Global Azure Bootcamp and said, yes, you're approved. And I was like, uh, I literally just had a drunken brain fart. Uh, what do you mean? And a month later, here we are. We literally put this together in a month. Um, so most people would be working on their versions of the uh, Azure Boot Camp over a six month period. We have been lucky. Um, when I put the call for speakers out, we got a great group of speakers from all over the world, not just here in Ireland, not just here in Europe, but all over the world submitting sessions. So we've speakers from Asia, we've got speakers from Europe, we've got speakers from America and Canada. So We've got a lot of different content, a lot of different types of content in Microsoft Azure. It's not just infrastructure, it's not just dev, there's governance, there's security, there's infrastructure as code, there's DevOps, there's all sorts of things. And we've got this running in three different time zones. We've got it running in Perth, Beijing, we've got it running in UK and Ireland, and we've got it running in the west coast of the US. So there is nearly 24 hours of sessions to watch here on YouTube and you'll be able to watch them over the weekend. That brings me to the topic of this talk, change. Um, a guy called Heraclitus of Ephesus, two and a half thousand years ago, said something along the lines of, the only thing that is constant is change. And he was right. Not just about society or philosophy or anything like that, but even IT, which didn't exist obviously back then. We've seen it throughout history. If you look over the last few hundred years, industry has changed. Once upon a time, manufacturing was a manual task. It was done by hand. Then with steam power, we had the Industrial Revolution. And that changed with electrification. Ford created the assembly line. And now machinery, equipment, tools, whatever it is we want, were mass-produced in a fast, repetitive manner that reduced the cost of those things. Computers, or electronics, brought us robots. So now that factory line that existed in the early 1900s is completely different. Change is unavoidable. If you look at our own industry, you can see how the computer has changed. From that very first real computer in 1942, 
and the fir- that famous computer that was delivered on the back of a truck in 1957, right through the Microsoft history. Microsoft, which started in 1975, developing Altair, uh, or ba- visual- basic for the Altair, right through MS-DOS and the original version of Windows, the first version of Windows that we use today, Windows NT, Windows Server in 2003, which was the first real Windows Server to break into the large enterprise, and Hyper-V in 2008, which was Microsoft's first real hypervisor, which eventually became Microsoft Azure. Yeah, Azure is running on Hyper-V, who knew? But it wasn't back then, it was actually based on a cousin of Hyper-V. So we've seen huge amounts of change, all the way from 1942 to 2010 and on. And if you're working in the cloud, you're used to this. We have a loader, another comparison. If you look at the, the computer that was used to launch a rocket on the first moon landing, and compare that to a typical smartphone from today, that smartphone is 700 times faster, has 750,000 times more RAM, 4 million times more storage, and is 217 times lighter than that computer that aided one of the biggest achievements in the history of humankind. And that computer back then was 10 years ahead of its time. That smartphone fits into your pocket and doesn't even compare to what the cloud can offer. The cloud is humongous. How big is it? Well, if we look at what Microsoft's cloud services are based on, so this is their a map or an abstracted map of their global WAN. It it's thought that Microsoft's WAN is the second largest WAN on the planet. Microsoft owns, co-owns, or leases over 100,000 miles of fiber networking that spans the planet several times. And this is just an abstracted view of it, and it's probably quite out of date as well. It's huge. Each of these little dots here is an abstraction of the physical locations where Microsoft has data centers. There are two types of data centers in their cloud world. In the Azure space, we have 52 regions, most of which are operational. Those regions are multiple data centers each, and they host Azure services. So when you're running virtual machines, if you're deploying databases, if you're doing artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's hosted in one of those 52 regions. You select which of those regions you want to deploy those services into. When you're accessing this network from the outside, you're going through these edge sites. And there are over 130 of these edge sites around the planet. And they assist access to Azure, Office 365, Xbox Live, you name it. They provide a local entry point onto this WAN. So if you're browsing uh, a service uh, that's hosted in the United Kingdom from Australia, you're actually going through an, a local edge site to get onto that Microsoft WAN, and then you're routing across that Microsoft WAN to that service that's hosted halfway across the world. That gives you a very low latency connection, so you don't have to span that path indirectly across the internet, which would be a very indirect and latent path. Those edge sites also provide Azure services, so content delivery networking, or front door, both of which allow you to accelerate uh, online or, or uh, HTTP, HTTPS services, and also Azure's global DNS service, so you can host your own DNS zones in Azure, so you can buy them from somewhere else and then change the, the zones to use the name servers of Microsoft's Azure uh, DNS service. One of these regions is made up of multiple physical data centers. These are just some of the buildings in this particular region. They're pretty huge. I think you can get an idea of that by just looking at the cars or automobiles, depending on where you are, and comparing them to the size of the buildings. These buildings are designed for servers and disks and cooling and storage. They are not designed for humans. There's only a small part of the this environment that you would consider as human friendly. The rest of it is machine friendly. This is huge. There are probably millions of physical machines in this particular region. And remember, you're only looking at a part of the region here. How big is this environment? Well, you probably know this building, the Empire State Building in New York. If you were to take that data center at the back and stand it on its end, it would be the same height as the Empire State Building. 
that's pretty big. And you can access all of that capacity or some of that capacity. If you're small, you have the comfort of knowing that you're getting into a huge environment, that you have the same security, the same automation, the same control, the same everything as the big guy. And you have the ability to grow. And if you're big, well, you have access to all this capacity, more than you've probably been, ever been able to build yourself, and it's better secured than anything you could ever do yourself. Why are we going to the cloud? Well, it's pressure. Business pressure. That's what's driving us to the cloud. We have a need to change. We have a need to grow. We have a need to automate. We have a need to embrace new technologies and new approaches. We're always looking to be more efficient. Whether it's to reduce costs, whether it's to be faster or more flexible, there's always that big drive. Do it quickly. Do it fast. And that quickly and fast leads to competition. If you don't do it, your competition will. And if your competition is in the cloud and is taking advantage of how the cloud can work, that's the important piece. How the cloud can work then they can use its new and advanced features, the stuff that isn't available in a traditional physical data center. They could be more innovative. They could be more agile. They can introduce services more quickly than you can. They can produce new versions of applications very, very quickly. So you can be as fast as Microsoft or Google or Amazon are if you take advantage of the, the technologies and the approaches and the methodologies and the design patterns that the cloud offers. And to do that, you will need to embrace change and you will need to learn. This is important. You are going nowhere without changing. Heraclitus was right. Change is inevitable. And if you do not change, you'll go the way of, of the dinosaurs. The cloud is huge, as I said. A huge amount of data is being created every day and it's got to go somewhere. And it's a cloud that is consuming that data, or storing that data, or processing that data. 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are being created every day. And that's a quote from last year. That's probably much higher now. 2.5 quintillion bytes. That's a huge, huge number. That's astronomical. It's a lot of zeros. That's what it is. And where's this data coming from? Well, there's lots of different places. It's not just, you know, you updating a record in a database. It could be IoT. More and more, we're seeing smart devices being deployed. Cars are running Azure Edge in the engine compartment and are sending data back to data centers to be analyzed. Airplanes are sending data when they land back to data centers to report on how well the engine is uh, working and how efficiently the pilot is uh, running that engine. This particular company is an Irish company, and I'm putting in Irish examples because I know them, and they're not huge companies. These are small companies who've been innovative and creative and have come up with something before someone else. This company, based in Limerick called Action Point, has an IoT solution where you can introduce IoT to legacy factory systems. Report on vibrations, temperatures, and other different metrics, send it back to the cloud, and analyze that data using machine learning and Power BI. It's another interesting one. If you're in a rural area or you have come from a rural area, you know how much or how valuable an individual calf is to a farmer. Every one of those calves that's born in the spring is an asset to that business. And it is a difference between profit and loss for that business. So the farmer wants to know when a cow is calving so he can make sure that that calf is safely brought into the world. Using this device called Moot Call, which is attached to the tail of the cow, they understand when that cow is about to go into birth. So they can be there if necessary to bring that calf into the world. All that data is going up into Azure and then comes back down onto their phone. It's analyzed in Azure so it understands the difference between a cow having a poo and a cow having a calf. One you might be interested in is sports. So there's a company in Northern Ireland called Stat Sports who sell a solution to f sports franchises all over the planet. You name the sport, they're probably involved in it. Basketball, baseball, American football, soccer, rugby, Irish sports, everywhere. Premiership, La Liga, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, they have it covered. 
A device on the back of the athlete sends data to a central point where it's forwarded up into Azure and then analyzed and processed and could be used by coaches to understand how those athletes are performing, could be used by physios to understand how injuries are repairing. It could also be used to send data to a, a large screen in a stadium to make that experience more interactive. And these are interesting examples. Like I said, none of these companies are huge. They saw what the cloud could offer and they decided that they wanted to innovate. As an airline pilot, I know that to fly with the best, you need to work with the best. With over 13,000 engines in operation around the globe, Rolls-Royce provides the services to maintain them at peak performance. Today, each engine has thousands of sensors that can produce terabytes of data on long-haul flights. Making sense of all that data is critical in transporting my passengers safely and efficiently. Rolls-Royce uses Azure IoT Suite to analyze data remotely and deliver real-time, actionable insights to me and to the airlines about engine performance and operational efficiencies. Advanced analytics help us optimize fuel economy, anticipate maintenance needs, and avoid costly downtime and delays. A single unscheduled disruption and its knock-on effect to a fleet and the passengers can cost an airline up to a million dollars a day. With early notice, our team can proactively have parts at the right place and time, reducing inventory costs and maximizing availability. Up to one-third of a plane's weight is fuel. As a pilot, I decide how much fuel my plane carries. Insights into engine efficiency, weather conditions, flight path and scheduled landings impact my decision. Cortana Intelligence helps me choose the optimal fuel level to maximize efficiency. With 40% of our operating budget devoted to fuel, even a small percentage reduction can save us tens of millions of dollars each year. Microsoft and Rolls-Royce, reaching new heights in customer value. The sort of changes that you see in those sorts of videos from Microsoft cannot be achieved by trying to hold on to the past. When you move to the cloud, you have to go through a process of digital transformation. It's a must do. It is the only way that you can take advantage of what the cloud can offer. Without doing this, you're just bringing old problems to the future and probably making them more expensive, to be quite honest. This process requires it there is a transformation done. This transformation doesn't just affect the technology, it affects you too. You need to change how you perceive IT, you need to change how you do things in IT as well. If you look at the typical process that a company goes through to get to the cloud, it starts off with an assessment. They might use Azure Migrate or some third-party solution to scan their VMware, their Hyper-V, their physical environment, and identify candidates that can be moved to the cloud, figure out costs, figure out sizings, identify clusters of machines or services that operate as a service and should be migrated together. And then they go through a migration process, typically using Azure Site Recovery or ASR to replicate those virtual machines to Azure and then stand them up in a orchestrated manner. So they f the process is called failing over, but they can br shut, cleanly shut down the virtual machines on premise or on premises and bring them online in Microsoft Azure. And for most businesses, that's where they stop. And they will never be able to do the sort of things that you see in those videos. They will never go beyond the limitations of IaaS. They will stick to old problems. They will continue to use third-party backup to back up their guest operating systems. But in the cloud, they bring these old practices with them and it doesn't work anymore. You have to start looking at how the cloud was designed and you have to innovate how you do things. You have to change your design patterns. You have to change your operational patterns. You have to change your security and your governance patterns to work the way that the cloud does. And then you can be agile, then you can be flexible, then you can compete and win. And the way to do that is to go through this transformation process. And this transformation process, it can be done in one of two ways. We can assess, identify the transformation possibilities, and then integrate that into our migration. 
or we can assess do the migration and then once we're in the cloud look at how we can transform so I'll give you two different examples I could be taking a virtual machine running SQL server and moving that to the cloud a simple migration would say right I take this VMware virtual machine and I run it as an Azure virtual machine with SQL server and then I can look at transforming that and say right why do I need to run a virtual machine running SQL server I can act in this particular case I can take that database and put it into Azure SQL managed instance and get rid of that virtual machine and now my applications will simply connect to that Azure SQL managed instance the same way they connected to SQL server in that virtual machine and that's what you would see there the alternative would be the assessment would identify this database is a candidate for Azure SQL managed instance don't migrate the virtual machine migrate the database and then we should constantly be looking at how we can transform. So Azure SQL Managed Instance might be great today, but maybe our application changes and we might be able to move that database from Managed Instance to the more affordable Azure SQL. Or maybe our application get re gets redeveloped and maybe we take that database away from SQL Server altogether and we migrate that data into Azure Cosmos DB for a truly global scale, highly resilient database that's designed for event-driven or serverless-based applications. Most of us are familiar with compute, the concept of a virtual machine or a physical server, so let's talk about that for an example. Here's your typical design that you will see. It's, this is from a Microsoft reference architecture for a three-tier application. There's web servers running behind a load balancer. There is middle tier or application servers running in a second uh, subnet. There's database servers running in a third subnet. There's jump boxes and domain controllers. There's a lot of different stuff going on in here. But how does this scale? If this particular application has a huge burst in activity in the lead up to the Christmas sales, can this web application scale out? Can this application scale out? Sure, Azure has functionality for doing that with virtual, virtual machines, but it's not instant. And how much are you going to lose? It's complicated. There's a lot of overhead to make that system work. These databases, you still have to install operating systems and install SQL Server and patch that thing and apply service packs and then upgrade it every few years. There's a lot of overhead here. What if well, I could deploy that same thing but using the platform of Azure? So now I'm using a different practice. I'm still using Tomcat. I'm still using IIS and those web services. But now I'm just not worried about the virtual machine. Microsoft are looking after that. That sits under the covers. I just tell it, you know what? I would like so many instances of this. And automatically my content is distributed and replicated across those instances. And they're automatically load balanced. I can evolve this using the app service environment to get a, a, a d design that's compliant with things like PCI DSS using virtual networking and firewalling. I've got database here. That's actually better than that database cluster I showed you before because that Azure SQL database actually has three always on cluster nodes. And I can accelerate using things like Redis Cache. I can integrate it with other features like Azure Search. I can also take advantage of other platform features like Content Delivery Network or even Traffic Manager or Front Door to provide scale out across multiple different physical regions or to accelerate the performance of that application across the planet. There are no operating systems in here for me to maintain, patch, secure. Instead, my developers create code and publish code and I get scalability. It can auto scale based on performance metrics and it's rapid. I can deploy this fast. I can change it fast. And the best bit, it's cheaper than running VMs. So it's better and cheaper. It's faster and it's bigger scale. What's not to like? This applies to data too. I've just talked about SQL Server. When it comes to databases and database servers, what do you actually care about with these things? Is it the virtual machine? Is it the operating system? Is it the SQL Server or MySQL Server engine or the Oracle engine? Or is it the actual data and the schema of that data? Are those the things that you really value? If you're running virtual machines, if you're addicted to virtual machines, 
Why are you wasting so much time on the stuff that isn't of value? The VM configuration, the operating system, the patching, the, seek, the database management server, the disk configuration. All that stuff's a distraction. What you actually care about is the data and the schema. Use the platform features. Use Azure Database for MySQL, Azure Deba Database for uh, MariaDB. Use Cosmos DB. Use Azure SQL. Use Azure SQL Managed Instance if you need true SQL Server compatibility. And dispense with all the distractions. Store the data. Use the data. Configure the data. Don't waste time on the infrastructure. This is some, an area that I'm working in a, quite a lot, which is security. I spend a lot of time working in Azure Security, and one of the big challenges I have in helping customers to migrate to the cloud is to get them to let go of old concepts and tools. Everyone has a particular favorite brand of firewall that they want to bring to Azure. You know, if they've been using Cisco on-prem, they want to use Cisco in Azure. If they've been using Checkpoint on-prem, they want to use Checkpoint in Azure. Let me break it to you. There isn't a single good NVA. They don't scale, they don't offer performance, they offer complexity, they offer cost. And they probably limit your ability to do things well. If you leverage the platform features, whether you're using Azure or some other cloud, you will have a better solution. It will be easier to manage, it will scale automatically, and it will innovate faster than anything else, and it won't introduce bad practices which you will see with some of these third-party solutions. Thinking that your classic firewall, your disk encryption, your antivirus is going to be enough security, it's not. To be quite honest, they really aren't. If that's your approach, this is what's going to happen to you. The bad guys are going to laugh while they're taking your money. You've got to be innovative. You've got to be creative. You've got to use different solutions in the cloud. And the cloud offers different security solutions. IDS IPS doesn't have to just sit in the firewall. It can exist across your entire network deployment. You can leverage features like NSG Flow Analytics, uh, Security Center, to scan everything across your entire virtual network infrastructure. Security Center reads the network security matrix. So all these signals coming in from storage accounts, from virtual machines, from firewall appliances, from web application firewall gateways, all coming into a central point to be analyzed by machine learning, looking for known patterns of bad behavior that no human could ever use. That's an awful lot better than sending everything to a sysfull, where you can interrogate the data after you've been attacked. I personally would rather have Security Center analyzing that data before or while I'm being attacked to help me stop the attack either before it starts or uh, just after it starts. And that brings us to governance. This is something that a lot of businesses who they've been in Azure for a while, they've enabled self-service so their devs and their testers and their delegated admins are off doing things without centralized management. There is no control of identity which is the weakest part of your business. There is no control over data, which impacts things like regulatory compliance for things like PCI DSS, SOX, um, HIPAA, and GDPR. There is no control how people are connecting to things because, well, if I've got free control over Azure, I can create my own public IP addresses and I can have entry points into my business from all over the place without any central management or control by the people who know how to do that stuff. And governance needs to be applied. You need to control these different things to secure your business and your data. Because if you don't, you will be punished. Things like the GDPR will fine you huge amounts of money if you're caught with your pants down. You also need to configure or reconsider how you're going to deploy stuff and configure stuff. If you're using Azure for the first time, you're going to be doing it using this thing, a mouse and the Azure portal. And I work in the Azure portal constantly. It is my primary tool, but the reality is when I'm working at scale, using the mouse is the slowest way of deploying things. Instead, we need to look at how we can deploy things using infrastructure as code. And we also should look at how we can embrace the DevOps mentality or methodologies. Infrastructure as code 
allows us to describe the result of a deployment. So there's different ways of doing this. You can use Terraform if you want to go multi-cloud, but if you want to be specific to Azure, you can use ARM templates or JSON. And this allows us to describe how we want to deploy things. Now you're going to hear a lot more about this from my colleague Damian Flynn, who also works with me at InnoFactor. And he's going to talk about really good practices around infrastructure code as code and DevOps. But I'll be quite honest, when Microsoft first talked about infrastructure as code, I turned off. I wasn't interested. I just thought, developers, large businesses, you know what? I started learning this stuff because I needed to do repetitive things with small, medium businesses. That's what drove me to learn how to do this. And the amount of time I save is incredible. I've done some large projects recently where I've deployed the solutions using infrastructure as code or ARM templates. And the amount of time that I invested in that for the first customer was an instant reward for that second customer. That first customer, a couple of months of work. Second customer, a day to create an ident nearly identical deployment. Different names, different IP addresses, but nearly identical. And if you work in that sort of space where you need to be able to create test, dev, and production environments and be able to iterate that, or if you need to be able to deploy out environments for small, medium businesses, and you want to do that in a consistent manner because you're providing a managed service, well, infrastructure as code is something that you should look at. If you want to enable lesser skilled people to be able to deploy things, well, have the better skilled people create the templates and the lesser skilled people deploy those templates. And DevOps can integrate into this not just for the developers, but also so you can control the, the templates. So people can collaborate together, they can test them, they can validate them, and they can iterate them and deploy them using a controlled technology. A, 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 that's a different mentality than the traditional waterfall approach to project management. You're going to hear a lot of different things today. I've covered a lot of different areas and at a high level. If you want to learn more about them, then tune in the rest of this day. We have sessions covering all sorts of different topics. Data, infrastructure, platform, AI, development, DevOps, security, governance, you name it, we have it covered from the Azure perspective. No matter where you are in the world, we have content for you. So if you're in Perth, Beijing, the Middle East, the UK Ireland time zone, or Europe, if you're in North or South America, if you're in Africa, heck, if you're in the South Pole, we have content for you. We have nearly 24 hours of content. Each of the sessions is maximum of 45 minutes, or at least it should be. Um, so you can take them in bite sizes today or over the weekend, and there should be a lot of learning for you. And take my advice. Try attend sessions that are outside your area. That's how you learn. That's how you realize there are other ways of doing things. There are other interesting things that I can talk to my colleagues about who maybe do work in that space. If you have any questions, put them on Global Azure Online on Twitter. Use that same hashtag if you want to share any comments. If you want to learn more about the event, go to HTTPS Global Online Azure Bootcamp wordpress.com that's global online azure bootcamp .wordpress.com. and you can find all of our sessions on youtube we've got lots of different categories set up there so you can view the different sessions in different ways each of the sessions will be released on the hour every hour for the rest of this day i hope you have a great day i hope you learn a lot and hopefully i'll see you around thank you very much i've been aiden finn and welcome to the global azure online bootcamp Social media makes it possible for trends to explode globally and instantaneously. At Damco, we are specialized in supply chain solutions that require specific, very dedicated customer focus. We help companies create efficiency in big market demands so they can stay ahead. Now, trends can ignite and we need to help companies react fast. The customers do expect that we know exactly what is happening by when and that we are very reactive if disruptions are happening. An excellent way to do this is by creating visibility. We need to think out of bounds what else is out there. This is where Microsoft Services comes into the equation in helping us to think about what is the next step.
For example, Damco works with companies in the fashion industry. If a video of one of their products goes viral, they may get a sudden surge in demand. So we partner with Microsoft Services to transform the way that we monitor our customers' supply chain. And that is where Damco is using technology that helps us to see the trends happening before the orders are there. With the addition of IT, we have been able to innovate and streamline services. Now everyone along the supply chain is on the same page with Damco app and can see disruptions as they happen and react much more quickly. The Microsoft Cloud has transformed the way data moves from endpoints to cloud and directly to our app. What in the past has taken us six to nine months, we can do now in three to five working days. What you need is a partner that helps you day in and day out on this journey when you run into concrete obstacles and concrete problems. And this knowledge transfer to help us to become a digital company, this is where Microsoft Services helps us a lot. Becoming a digital company is predominantly about the user experience of our clients. Decisions about disruptions can be made instantaneously, logistics can adapt, and demand can be met. This is the real differentiator. At Damco, our promise and philosophy is to stay ahead. With Microsoft help, we are doing just that. Thank you.